God. He is great and greatly to be praised. Amen. Did anybody believe that? Why don't you leap to your feet, lift your hands and praise him tremendously. He's done good things for us. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to say what an honor and a treat it is to be back at Heritage again, to be invited to speak at this meeting is indeed a highlight of one's entire existence. And to be invited back again, I don't even know where you put that kind of honor, but I want to say that I feel so very humbled by this, and I'm so grateful that God has been kind. The preaching has been outstanding. I agreed with with uh, Pastor Burgess when he said these words. I wish these men had quit preaching to the preachers and start preaching to these young people. He said, I'm getting tired of repenting every service. Praise God. All I can tell you is that in every service, the visitation of the Holy Ghost has been so rich and so real, and it's helped us. The only reason I quit praying and I was back there, Brother Dunlap, and if I unplugged anything at all, I'm not sorry one bit because God was back there and it felt good. But I do apologize. Amen. But but, um, the only reason I quit is because somebody asked us to stand. Amen. I started praying against old Brother Simon in here. Amen. And uh, I don't know what to say about Elder White except that I've never met a man that has his finger on the pulse of the apostolic church like this man seems to consistently bring to us in every meeting that we hear him preach. And I love him. And the inimitable, God-anointed, and God-blessed Elder Howard. What a man of God. And didn't he minister in the Holy Ghost to us last night? And I want to bring into my future what God is doing right here. Amen. And uh, Brother Lawhorn preached yesterday, and it was so deep. And I so tremendously appreciate the good word of the Lord. You know, you're getting old when they start talking about what a benefit you have been. And I looked into the mirror, and I saw my grandfather looking back at me. I got a notice in the mail that said, it's been a long time since you updated your picture on your driver's license, hurry down here and get it done. And I sent my father instead, and um, it's, it's, it's just hideous. But uh, one of the benefits of living this long and staying in the apostolic church is I am preaching to young adults that I was privileged to preach to your parents when they were teenagers. And to see the inheritance that God has given to this apostolic church, that is tremendous. Amen. And we're so grateful. If you're wondering what this is, this is a walking stick that belongs to Elder D.C. Moody. And uh, he said, Brother Garrett, one thing you'll know is I'm lending you my support. And I appreciate having his support. Elder Howard. Knowing what we know about Bishop Moody, I dare not throw this rod down. It might turn into a serpent. And I don't think I'd have the courage to pick it up by the tail. And uh, I'd have to call Elder Moody, and he may let me swim on my own. God is good. Right here in the front are some of the finest young people that God has ever blessed a man to be able to associate with. And I'm so proud of you, and I love you. And I look across this building and wow, wow. I don't know where you can put three or 400 more chairs, but you better get ready. You're going to need them. When the spirit of the Lord that goes out with all of these young people gets broadcast around, folks are going to say, we missed it, but we won't miss it next time if the Lord tarries. Aren't you grateful for what the Lord is doing, what he has done? I give honor to the Holy Ghost. I give honor to my pastor, Elder Morton, 
I love my great man of God. I'm always in submission to him. One time he called me and the secretary said he's on the line. I picked up the phone and said, praise the Lord, elder. And without any preamble at all, he said, Ron Garrett, God is mad at you. And I could hardly breathe. I'm not kidding when I say that. I couldn't get a breath. And then he went on to explain why God was mad because I wasn't taking care of my voice. And I repented. Thank God for a real man of God in your life. I think my number one fan is right over here to my left. Amen. And I appreciate her and that handsome man standing beside. Numbers chapter 21, verse number 16, if you have your Bible. And from thence they went to Be'er, that is the well whereof the Lord spake unto Moses, gather the people together, and I will give them water. Then Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well, sing ye unto it. The princes digged the well, the nobles of the people digged it, by the direction of the lawgiver with their staves. And from the wilderness they went to Matanah. Let's pray together. God, we love you. And we thank you very much for your help in this house. I want you, God, to know that we lean on you heavily. This is your church and these are your people. Strengthened today by your great grace. We'll give great honor and credit to you especially. We'll thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name. Turn and shake somebody's hand around you and tell them you look better than I remember what happened. And you may be seated. Now, I want to introduce my my thought that I feel like the Holy Ghost has laid on my spirit by drawing a picture if possible very easily uh, drawn, but I don't want to dwell on it. I am by nature not a negative person. And by, by being filled with the Holy Ghost and trying to have an active prayer life, and a consistent worship when I get into the presence of the Lord. I don't know how a person could be negative. I just don't, I don't think you could. But I'm not by nature <clears throat> negative. If you ask me how I'm doing, I'll tell you the truth. I'm doing well. I'm happy. I'm satisfied. I feel good in God. Married the right woman. Got wonderful children, far above average. Pastor of the best church in Pentecost, bar none. Glad God didn't call me to Oklahoma, oh Lord. That's right. And uh, it's just, it's a pleasure just to live life and uh, to go through life. But there are some times that we are aware of. I told the congregation recently that, uh, do you know what? A thousand politicians at the bottom of the sea is. It's a very good start. That's what it is. And our world that we're living in is not looking real healthy. An epic is a period of time in history or a person's life, typically one marked by notable events or particular characteristics. In the year 1776, December the 23rd, Thomas Paine wrote, These are the times that try men's souls. In Charles Dickens' famous and wonderful writing, the book, A Tale of Two Cities, oft quoted, you've heard it before, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. 
It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We'd had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In Acts chapter 12, where Herod has stretched forth his hand and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then the scripture says, then were the days of unleavened bread. And I do understand it's talking about a particular time in Jewish feasting and acknowledgement of God's presence and help. But I also believe, and I have used this often, that it was a time of great persecution. These were the days, then were the days of unleavened bread. Hebrews 11 and 36 tells us about some folks in a very difficult time. They had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. And then the 38th verse starts this way, of whom the world was not worthy. If it could be said of any generation, at least in my memory, or the things that I've read in recent history, truly, the world is not worthy of such an apostolic group moving among them. And were it not for the need of evangelism and reaching souls, it would be very easy to begin to cry out, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Paul wrote about these times to Timothy, and he said this, know also that in the last days, would you say the last days? That means before the coming of the Lord. That means before the wrap-up of what we know as planet Earth and lifestyle as we have lived it. And grown accustomed to. Know this. Uh, this know also that in the last days perilous times. Truly we are living in those perilous times that Paul said shall come. Daniel chapter 12 and verse number 1. Talking about prophetic utterance about the day that we're living in. At that time shall Michael stand up. The great prince which standeth up for the children of thy people and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since was a nation that's quite a statement since was a nation trouble that will visit the earth like we've never known it or like the history of the word of God has ever proclaimed it and then the Bible said, and at that time shall thy people, thy people shall be delivered. Every one that shall be found written in the book. Every one. And so in the economy of God, I believe that we are living in those days that truly we could describe the darkness of blackness. It's a difficult time. Spirits that we fight and things that we contend with, we've never contended with. At least I never have. Things that are accepted as normal in this generation were abnormal. They were aberrant. They were called uh, things other than normal. But if the scripture that, that we read has ever been fulfilled, it is fulfilled in this day when they shall call good evil. What we're doing in here today, preaching, praising, honoring, leading, loving God, giving God the praise, asking you to buy into a relationship with God, asking you to feel for him, though he be not far from any one of us, inviting you to take into your heart a revelation of God, his greatness, and living for him, 
in many circles would be considered to be abusive to your mind and to your spirit. But I'm going to tell you, it's not abusive. It's safe. And this good that's going on here, it is not evil. And the evil that's out there in the world, it is not good. I'm sorry. It's not good. Somebody said, praise the Lord. Paul writes, said 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3 in part, For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. There's never been a time in my lifetime that I have seen such lines of demarcation drawn and such, such differences in the apostolic movement and such movements that are coming to the apostolic to divide us from one another and to create in us a carnal thinking and cause us to lose our beautiful power, authority, and relationship with the beautiful name of the Lord Jesus Christ through his purity, his holiness, and the revelation of the mighty God in Christ and in Acts 2.38 salvation message If there's ever been a time that we could point to and say, that is a falling away, that's the day we're living in right now. My God, have mercy. I thank God for the spirit I feel here. I've been in some places where spirits were ricocheting off of the walls, where you could feel big devils sitting in the congregation, and you knew that it was tough and hard. And a lot of darkness was sitting on those chairs. And that's not a comfortable feeling for a pastor or for a preacher. But I'm going to tell you, there's some men preaching at this conference. We accept that challenge. I said we accept that challenge. Bring it on. The darker the night, the brighter the light. And then in verse 7, he said, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. I was thinking about my man of God, thinking about him. And uh, there's nobody in life, I think, that loves my pastor more than I do. Maybe they love him as much, but I love him. He is my man of God. He is very famous among us. For his clarion call of a renewal of the Holy Ghost. A renewal of the Spirit. If you get around him very long. If he comes to preach at your assembly. Somewhere. If he's there more than just a night or two. He is going to go to the word of God. And he's going to pull out Titus 3 and 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And he's going to call for a renewal of the Holy Ghost. I can see him as a 32-year-old new pastor. And I'm sitting on the chairs as a 19-year-old teenager as his hair is falling down across his forehead, his neck tie is unskewed and his shirt tail is hanging out and his jacket has already been abandoned and I can see him red face as he screams out it's done talking time in truth tabernacle I tell you I've got that in my spirit it's tongue talking time Tongue-talking time at Heritage. Tongue-talking time at your church. Tongue-talking time in your prayer closet. Tongue-talking time every morning. Praise God. He would push hard. Everybody pray through. Not too long ago, came to our place and and, uh, we were graced. He preached us a revival. And what a revival it was. And what blessing it was. But I'll never forget the night that he stopped midstream, turned, 
And he said, I feel a me, myself, and I spirit. And he began to proclaim, if this church does not get the selfishness out of your heart and get a spirit of outreach and a spirit of God, if this church does not pray through to an experience of the Holy Ghost, you're going to pass by this place someday and you're going to point at this property and you're going to say, that's where Brother Garrett used to pastor and that used to be a good, strong apostolic church. Now I'm going to tell you, it bothered me greatly. Not that he said it, but that he had to say it. And Valley Pentecostal Church knows that we've been on a quest ever since. We're not going to have that spirit. We're not going to be a byword in Pentecost. We're not going to be a distant memory. But we are going to be apostolic from the top of our head all the way to the soles of our shoes. Praise the Lord. It's put a fire in my spirit. It's put a burning in my belly. It's put something rolling in my spirit. I don't have time to mess with foolishness. I don't have time to mess with with dissension. I don't have time to mess with rebellion. Get out of our way. Get out of our altars. Get out of our assembly. Leave us alone. We've got something on our mind. We've got God in our heart and our spirit. Oh, clap your hand and shout unto the Lord. In some circles, my bishop is infamous. In some quarters, they don't want to hear him. They don't want to listen to his voice. Because of what a fresh praying through would produce in their assembly. What it would produce in their youth group. What it would produce in their families. What a fresh praying through would do for them. A fresh anointing, a fresh purity, a fresh wholesomeness, a fresh rejection of the carnal nature, a fresh view of the repulsiveness of sin at anything sinful. When we get into the presence of a holy God, it Turn something on on the inside of us that said, sin, you're not crossing into this home. You're not crossing into my car. You're not crossing into my life. You're not crossing into my relationship. You're not crossing into my entertainment. You're not crossing into my fellowship. Do you believe that young man? Do you believe that young ladies? My Lord, we need that. We need it. We must magnify our Holy Ghost experience. We are building more of the same. When we received the baptism of the Holy Ghost at the altar, we started with repentance. And in that repentance, it was just an open door. It was not a final sealed deal. But when we come back for a Holy Ghost renewing, we go back through the process of checking our lives, checking our spirit, checking our hearts out. Is everything right between me and God? Is everything right between me and my spouse? Is everything right in my home? Is everything right in my behavior? And then we were washed in the water, the beautiful waters of baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it gave us freshness and cleanness and purity. And we walked out feeling so good about ourselves and so good about God and about living for God. I submit to this great group of of apostolic young people that we must magnify our Holy Ghost experience. Uh, We must magnify the touch of God in our lives. Uh, We must visit again and again and again and again that place where we met God uh, to meet him again, to visit 
feel his presence one more time. Some of you are a little slow on your feet this morning and a little slow in your heart. That's all right. We're going to catch up to you just a little bit. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, Emotional response is not a bad thing. Fear is a motivator. Joy is a motivator. Happiness is is a motivator, and they're not the same, by the way. But but those are motivators. A longing is a motivator. But we don't live on an emotional experience. We don't trust our emotions. They will betray us. They'll get us in trouble. Amen. An emotional experience is not a bad thing. But that's not where we grow. That's not how we expand. That's not where we increase our knowledge of the holy and our experience in the purity of God. We've got to encourage righteousness in our lives by inviting the Holy Ghost to get into us again and to live in us and to walk in us and to speak through us. I'm making my apologies in advance that I am going to go longer today than I did the other night. I can already feel it. And I've already been out here in the pulpit for 27 minutes. And I'm trying my best to, to honor Elder Howard. But he stopped me earlier and said, take it all the way home. So I'm going to try to do it because it's burning in my spirit. But I'm going to tell you, he's got the mind of God. And some of you are going to believe that, as the elder said last night, that we've been in collusion about what to preach and that we're picking up little cues from one another and building us a little sermon. Oh, no. I came to this meeting with knowledge that God wanted me to speak on the very thing I'm speaking on today. Day. Before I heard the bishop last night, this was burning in my heart. We want the Holy Ghost daily. We want the Holy Ghost consistently. We want the Holy Ghost always. I'm going to tell you, it's not hard. It's not hard. I said it's not hard. Somebody said, ah, it's too hard to stay prayed up, prayed through. Oh, no. You're lying. You don't know what you're talking about. You're, you're too ignorant. You don't know what you're saying. It's not hard. It's hard to resist God. It's hard to resist the Spirit. It's hard to sit with your hands folded when the Spirit of God and the angels of glory start walking among us. It's not hard at all. We need to encourage that. Amen. Conversion is our aim. I said conversion is our aim. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you for the law horn. Conversion is our aim. Changing, changing. We've got that inattentional blindness on our mind. Conversion. I want to be like Jesus. The scripture tells us, and I'm going to misquote it on purpose, but I, I, I just want to say it this way. We are changed into his image from glory to glory. We are changed. We are changed. It's an ongoing process. It's a daily process. We're changed daily. Daily. And how are we changed? From glory to glory. Thank God, in prayer yesterday, I met the King of Kings. Thank God, in prayer yesterday, I felt the hovering brush of angels' wings. Thank God, yesterday, I felt the glorious experience of a new birth in my heart. But I was awakened early this morning without the alarm. And ah, the Lord was in the room. And I could feel him all over again as it began to pulsate in my spirit. 
daily from glory to glory. I feel a little more like Jesus. I feel a little more in his image. I feel made a little bit more in his likeness. I feel just a little bit more like he wants me to feel. I feel nearer. I feel dearer. I feel more important to him today than I did yesterday. I feel like I've got a little clout. I feel like I can ask him deep things. I feel like I can ask him hard things. I feel like I can get response from God. Hallelujah. I really do. Because I'm changed. We are changed day to day. And then the scripture concludes, and this is a direct quote, even by the spirit of the Lord. I was in conversation just recently. And in the conversation, as we always do, it got around to spiritual things. And I was commenting to the individual to whom I was speaking about the desire and the hunger and the things that God is doing, the miraculous healings. A man stood in my office or my study the other day and and really began to testify of the greatness of God. There's young ladies in our church that had incurable diseases and God has healed them. Folks that really needed a touch from God They have gotten it, and it's a thrill to my spirit and to my heart. And so we were talking about the good things of God. And he said, Ron, I want to tell you something. He said, I can't use the man's name, but you have confidence in him. And you would love him to be around him. And and he's a good man. But he said recently, he gathered with a group of men, and they went on a five-day fast in which they shut themselves up and they didn't come out for five days and they prayed many hours in the day seeking after God. And he said on the last evening of their being together, they had a visitation of the Lord and the Lord spoke to them supernaturally and he said, I am going to visit my church I'm going to pour my spirit out. I'm going to give tremendous revival. I'm going to put blessings upon my church of my spirit. They're going to need it. And I'm going to bring in many souls that are hungering after me. But then he said, but I'm only going to visit those churches that still bear my image. Brother Dunlap, that's gotten my attention. That has got a hold of my spirit. I'm searching my heart every day. As a pastor, am I promoting the image of God? And if not, forgive me and give me the direction and give me the balance and the courage to do it. In my personal life, in my home, am I bearing the image? And I want to so desperately because I believe that God is going to visit and when he visits it's going to be supernatural and it's going to be amazing when God would depict a backsliding Israel a backsliding church and in type a backsliding people he would say of them that they have committed two evils number one they have forsaken me the fountain of living water. Think about it. Think about it. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and they have hewn for themselves. They've had to work at it. They've had to strive to do it. When you hew something, it's like chipping away at solid rock, trying to build a basin that will hold a little water but he said they've hewn out cisterns but they are broken cisterns that can not 
hold water. Cannot hold water. That's how God looked at it. He wanted us to get the picture of a fresh flow, a fresh anointing, fresh oil, a fresh touch, a fresh experience, a fresh Holy Ghost. He wanted us to get an experience in our life that we would keep it new and he would allow it to spring up. Jesus to the woman at the well, if thou knewest the gift of God and you would have asked for it, I would have given thee living water. Verse 14, F, she said, I want that water. But, I, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Doesn't that sound good? Hey, fellas, doesn't that sound good? Hey, girls, doesn't that sound good? Springing up to everlasting life, always effervescent, always bubbling, always alive, always fresh, always exciting. Hey, young people, doesn't that sound good? Hey, church, doesn't that sound good? That sounds a lot better than an old stagnant, scummy pond. That sounds a lot better than an old dry, mud-cracked bottom where drought's gotten to it. That sounds a lot better than anything I can think about. I wish I knew where it was, but when we were very, very young, driving out of our home state of confusion, California, and going to see relatives... We passed by somewhere that it was beside the road. All I can remember in my child mind and memory is that it was rocky and craggy and it was shaded and somebody had driven an iron pipe into the wall of that, of, of that rock and out of that pipe was issuing a cold stream of water. My father pulled over. Those are before the days of air conditioning. We had 460 air conditioning. And in the Central Valley, you needed it. Roll all the windows down, do at least 60 to stay cool. Hallelujah. And, and, uh, but we got a drink. I'll never forget that. It was cold. It was fresh. Us little kids, five little old darlings, we, we ate bologna sandwiches there. Amen. Maybe I should have pastored in Oklahoma. I don't know. But we ate bologna sandwiches and we drank from that, that stream of water coming out of the rock. My, what a memory I have. I've tried to remember where that's at and go back to it. Tried to drive those old roads. And I've never seen anything like it in my adult life, but a well springing up. My, 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 fresh, fresh, everlasting light. John 7 talks to us about this Holy Ghost experience. And you know it, and you can quote it, and you probably quote it better than I could. In, that la- in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly that in man shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit. Everybody say the spirit. The spirit. Say it again. The spirit which they that believeth on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Amen. The well that springs up within us. That keeps us. That saves us. That redeems us. That regenerates us. That moves us to God. Is the Holy Ghost within us. 
give me a praying youth group. I'd rather have a praying youth group than a baseball team out of the youth group that can whip the denominals. Give me a worshiping youth group. Don't give me a youth group that sits on the steep with their arms folded, texting during church. Give me a youth group that's on fire, that knows the word of God, that testifies about the goodness of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I want that. I want that. I want it. That's where revival lives. That's where the anointing is. Our gimmicks won't get it done. It's already been covered, so I'll leave it alone. I've got to hurry along here. That Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you in times like these, in this dark hour, in the darkness of this day, we need a well. Everybody in this house needs a living well. Every church needs a living well. We got to have a living well. Forty-two minutes I've been here. Can I continue? Amen. You may be seated, so I'll hurry. Praise God. A living well. We need a living well. Thank you, Elder Howard, for taking us back to that living well. Amen. To that living well. Our text says these words. And from thence they went to Bayer. That is the well. Whereof the Lord spake unto Moses. Gather the people together. And I will give them water. I'm emphasizing that passionately. Because I feel it passionately. Bishop Johnson, you've electrified our movement with those words from Frank Bartleman that said, oh, the possibilities where purity and unity prevail. My God, have mercy. Those are emblazoned on my heart where purity and unity prevails. I'm so tempted to chase rabbits right now. I better not. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I better not. We'll never get through. Praise God. Purity and unity. My God, let us get in one mind. Let us have the same purpose. Follow the leader. God spake to Moses. Follow the leader. Follow the leader. Get behind your pastor. Get behind his vision. Get in the spirit of his desire. Devil, you're fitting to have a bad day. I can feel it in this house already. This meeting's going out with a powerful visitation of the Holy Ghost. Devil, you're fitting to have a bad, bad, bad. You're fitting to lose some clientele, devil. You're fitting to lose some folks that have been, been looking your way and thinking about joining up. You're fitting to lose them, devil. You believe that? Shout the loudest shout you got. Clap your hands as hard as you can. Worship God. Holy Ghost is fitting to fall all over this house. Somebody that hadn't prayed through yet. It's going to pray through today. Shout! God 
God said, gather them together. We are gathered together at Heritage 2018 in Colorado Springs. And God said, I will give them water. I'm telling you, you've been dry. You're fitting to get all wet. My God's not a liar. The Holy Ghost does not make mistakes. The Holy Ghost does not lie. I will, I will give them water. You may be seated. I've been up here 46 minutes. My God have mercy. I'm talking about when I stepped to this pulpit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to tell you like I told them at home recently. You do what you want to do, but you're not taking this away from me till I finish. Till I get this off of my spirit, you're not. You can't have this service yet. You get renewed anytime you want to. You can pray through anytime you want to. But until I get this out of my heart, you're not getting this service. This is not a mosh pit. This is not an arena for entertainment. And preaching is not entertainment. It's life. You may be seated. Then Israel... Sang this song. Amen. Praise God. There's only two places in the word of God that gives us these little short songs, and this is one of them. And the other's in the book of Isaiah. A little short song about spring up, talking about the wine. But in this verse of scripture, the Bible said that they are required. God is telling them. He's not offering them a suggestion. He is saying to them from the mouth of the lawgiver, Spring up, O well. Sing ye this song. Spring up, oh well. Does anybody feel like singing it? Spring up, oh well. Oh, don't be clueless here this morning. You can't sing spring up a well with your arms folded and your heart not with God. You got to put some gusto behind it. You got to put some fervor behind it. If you want that well to spring up, somebody's got to speak to the well. Spring up, spring up. Oh, well, spring up. Somebody practice it. Somebody, don't you give me a little charismatic smile. I 
been here an hour or 50, 50 minutes. You may be seated. Oh, God, have mercy. Sing ye unto it. Sing ye unto it. Sing ye unto it. Sing ye unto it. Every morning, sing ye unto it. Every service, sing ye unto it. While you're driving your car, sing ye unto it. Unless you've got rock and roll or hip hop or country western blaring, then bless your heart, you can't sing. Be seated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sing ye unto it. Sing ye unto it. Sing ye unto it. Hallelujah. The princes digged the well. The nobles of the people digged it. The princes digged the well. The nobles of the people digged it. Who are the princes? Part of the root of this word and the princess is dominion. Rulers. It means children of the king with the authority of the king's name. Holy Ghost is sitting to visit a bunch of princes. You haven't denied his name. You still got your one God apostolic heritage. You still love God. You may not be doing everything you ought to do, but you're a prince and you've got the ability to go back and start digging that well again. I dare you to dig it. I I dare you to dig it. I dare you to dig a well. I dare you to get it. I dare you to dig 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 it. I dare you. I dare you. I dare you to get over yourself. I dare you to get rid of your pride. I dare you to get over your carnality and dig, Prince, dig. Clap your hands and shout again. Oh, yeah. Who are the nobles? Who are the nobles? You may be seated. Who are the nobles? Those nobles, according to their definition, are those belonging to the hereditary class with high status. The nobles, princes digged, dominion, nobles digged, dominion, 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 dominion. That means authority. First John 5 and 18 said, we know that whosoever is known of God, that's the spirit, sinneth not, but he that is begotten of the Father, or begotten of God, keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. You get the Holy Ghost. You don't ever have to sin again. You get this Holy Ghost springing up. You won't have to worry about keeping your life clean. 
you won't want to drink. You won't want to look at pornography. You won't want to look at movies. You won't want to go to the world. You won't want a, a, a social media account. No, you won't. You want to live for God. Hallelujah. Amen. Psalm chapter 8 and verse 4 tells us, verse 4, 5, and 6 tells us that God has given man dominion over his creation. Those animals are for our benefit. Sorry, Peter. That's right. Brother Brown said he eats his vegetables secondhand. He said, He'll eat the cow, and the cow will eat the grass, and that's good enough for him. They're under our dominion. Come here, Fido. Sit. Boy, isn't that a well-behaved dog? Roll over. Play dead. <laughs> Amen. Brother Howard's got a dog that has to pray through often. Amen. Brother Howard said he's full of the devil, or was. I think he's no more. But anyway, that dog had to pray through often. And he'd tell him, pray through. That dog go down, cover his eyes, and go to growling and carrying on. I don't never saw anything like it in my life. Under dominion. Under dominion. Amen. If we want to make a building, we know how to go get the brick. We know how to pour the concrete. We know how to manufacture the steel. We know how to take things out of the... I'm, I'm going too long. I'm going way too long. <laughs> Oh, help me, God. I've been 57 minutes up here. My God, where has time gone? Where has time gone? But he gave us dominion and put it beneath our feet. Romans 16 and verse 20 tells us, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. Shortly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. That means settled, settled, settled. The God, the God of peace has given you dominion. Mark 6 and 7, and gave them power over unclean spirits. Luke 9 and 1, and gave them power and authority over all devils. Luke 10 and 19, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Be seated while I make sure I clear it up that I'm not talking about a charismatic kind of, I'm the child of God, I can do anything I want, and the devil can't hurt me. That's not what that's telling us. It's telling us that if we walk in the Spirit, if we walk in the Spirit, we will never fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we'll get the Spirit operating and moving in our life, We'll get the well springing up within us if we'll take dominion over our carnal nature. Be seated a moment longer. 59 minutes I've been up here. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy. Amen. Not the charismatic, I am king me. No power can resist me. No power, no power at all. But the Bible lets us to know that we have power to overcome sin. Power to say no and to make it stick. Power to walk in the spirit and to follow God. Power to make it through to the pearly gates. I'm here to declare if you want to, you can be saved. I'm here to tell you that if you want to, you can have the greatest revival in your youth group you've ever heard about. Amen. And then the Bible said, and they digged, they digged at the direction of the lawgiver with their staves with their staves that literally means 
walking sticks, walking sticks, built for support, built for security, built for the comfort of the individual that needs it. But the Bible said that they digged at the direction of the lawgiver with their staves. Now, I don't know how long it would take us to dig a well. I had a friend when he was 16 years of age, dug a 40-foot well. He had polio in his left hand, and he was he only had his right arm. But what a right arm it was. He could do almost a 1,000 pull-ups if you gave him time because that arm was so withered. But he dug that well by hand and brought it in. I don't know how long it'd take to dig a well. I don't think I could dig a hole in this right here if I worked at it all day and into next week taking this state and digging and digging and digging. And you stop and think about that for a moment, that the commandment was dig with the stave. He didn't say go get the shovels. He said get the stave. The walking sticks. Take your time to look at it. Look at it from the word of God. Get that walking stick out and dig. 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 It's going to take a while. But dig. Dig. It's going to take a little bit of effort. But dig. I'm in the Holy Ghost. Be seated. Some of you want an instant response. Some of you are going to go home from this meeting and you're going to say, my, what a great meeting. But nothing's going to change in you. You're going to be the same problem and worry to your pastor that you was before you got here. Some of you are going to still be sneaking and peeking and dipping and sipping. Some of you, the reason you don't have cigarette breath today is because you're in heritage and only because you're in heritage. Well, it's not in my notes, but I feel a strong unction. But get your stave out. Get your comfort. Get your walking stick. Get your balance out. You got a well yet? Be seated. And while you're doing it, and while you're doing it, sing a song. I know there's water down there. My father got water out of this spot. My pastor got water out of this spot. His pastor got water out of this spot. Spring up! Every once in a while, you may be seated. They'd run across something hard and heavy. Then there's a little crook in the end of this walking stick. And they'd have to reach down in that hole that they were digging with that little crook. Get a hold of that hard thing. Pull on it. It took a lot of time prying underneath it, working at it, digging at it. Ah. Some things take longer to dig out than other things. And he wants us to be aware. 
of how strong some of those things and some of those spirits have been entrenched in us. Elder, I'm infringing on your time and I'm apologetic. I really am. But you got to reach down. I believe that God wants us to dig because he wants us to be aware of how much it takes to get that junk out of our heart. That bitterness down there is like a hard pan. You better get rid of that bitterness. It's a feel sorry spirit. It's a me, myself, and I spirit. You better get rid of that spirit. You better get rid of that carnality. You better get rid of that resentment against your pastor, against his wife, against your youth leader, against your parents. I don't care what they did to you in your life. The Bible commands us, honor thy father and thy mother. I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. You got to dig. 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 Stick with it. Carefully remove the stumps and the branches and the boulders and the hard pan. Stick with it a little longer. Carefully remove those obstacles. Get them out. Get them out of your life. Because you never want to go back and have to do it again. seated a moment longer tell me the man from the Gadarenes wanted to go back to his demon possessed position when it takes a long time to get that stuff out of you you don't want to go back uh-uh. not me not me I've told this story at Heritage before but at 17 years of age in a real 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 battle with my father between wills then I was a big boy I was as tall as I am now and I was a big strong boy and my dad said if my belt's not enough I'll try these on you and I was on the verge of taking him up on it but there's too much respect built into my life that was my daddy and so I, I, I was angry I was filled with stuff and I, and I I went out and stood on the back porch and, and I looked over at my car and I fingered the dollars that were in my pocket and I knew exactly how much was there and I looked over at my room and, and remembered where my clothes were at and I was making up my mind uh, at 17 years of age uh, that I'm leaving the house. I've had all of this that I'm going to take and a spirit spoke to me just as loudly as I can hear anything in this building including my own voice on this PA. Then went Judas from the presence of Jesus and Satan entered into him. I made my mind up right there. Spring up, oh well. I don't care what it takes. That secret stash of marijuana, it's going. Those rebellious friends, they're gone. Spring up, oh well. You better spring up, oh well. You're the only thing standing between me and demon possession. You're the only thing standing between me and going to hell. Hallelujah. Please come. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, drummer. If there's a bass player and a guitar stringer, strummer, come on. My God have mercy. Oh, God. Oh, God. The other reason, the other reason, now hold on a second, just give me a minute longer. Amen. Just give me a minute longer. Then you can pick them up. But you're going to get divided here. And I, I want to make this last point. Amen. The other reason that I believe that he had them dig with staves is because the water 
was a lot closer to the surface than they believed. It was a lot easier to get there with the help of the lawgiver than you could possibly imagine. Spring up, oh well, spring up, spring up, oh well, spring Does anybody want to try your new song? You better start picking up chairs, men. Does anybody want to try your new song? Some of you need to come from the back of this building. Some of you need to come from the sides. Some of you need to come from the center section. And you need to come singing. Spring up, oh well, spring up. Spring up, oh well, spring up. Spring up, oh well. You've got to spring up within me, well. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to. i got to pray through now. I've got to have an up-to-date experience now. I've got to have a visitation before this meeting's over. Spring up. Come on, practice your song.
hearts that got your hands folded and you're just watching us. My God, help us. Don't backslide while these young people cry out. Come on, it's closer than you think it is. It's closer than you believe it is. A liberating flow of the Holy Ghost is here for you. Get aggressive! I need a renewal of the Holy Ghost! 